myself as opposed to others. That is contaminated mind. So that contaminated mind creates contaminated actions. Contaminated actions have three types of effects. A, A, right in defect, effects similar to the cause, and environmental effect. And let me give you a small explanation to highlight what I've been talking about. So you have some scriptural knowledge. This is from the scriptures, from the mind teachings called Lodic. Then, ripen effect is, whatever actions we create, they ripen and they give us the effect. Example, if we kill, if we harm our parents, if we, if we create schism, and it damages many people. Example, we talk negative things between two governments. They go to war, they kill millions of people. Schism. If we talk or act in such a way that creates harm and damage to people in such an intense way, the ripening effect will be we take rebirth. The most severest is hell. One of the, the hells. The next severest is taking rebirth as a spirit or hungry ghost. The next severe, severest is as an animal. So the immediate ripening effect of example killing, just example killing, will be one of the three lower realms. How we kill, the motivation, whether we regret, the manner, on purpose or not, all effects, how we take rebirth. So that's your immediate ripening effect. Is that clear? Second, is effects similar to the cause? Effects similar to the cause means what? We have experienced, number one, the ripening effect. Even we experience traces of that inclination will remain. Let me explain. If we have killed, if we have killed, we take rebirth in hell. But we have taken rebirth in hell to purify the karma of killing but the intent to kill is not purified. That mind is still there. So when we take rebirth again, we will be inclined to kill again and take rebirth in negative states of birth again and again. So what happens is now the first karma is instant ripening of the result of the karma. Second is you still have to suffer the tendencies or the effects similar to the cause. So the very reason you went to hell was for killing, but when you come out of ki when you come out of hell, you still want to kill. So what happens is you still want to harm. Example, tigers, when they die, they collect a tremendous negative harm from killing other sentient beings and creating fear. But when they reincarnate again, they'll still have the tendency to kill. Once they go down, it goes down very low. That's why some kids, when you see them, oh, they love to kill animals. They enjoy it. They squeal. Some, they can't take it. They can't take it all. It's very difficult for them. That's a tendency resembling the original cause. They will suffer from that. What's the big deal about that? Because the tendency will make you do it again, even if you're in a new environment. So if you want your slate clean, then you start killing again. What's the point? Similarly, people who always... Another example says in a text is, if we always have sexual misconduct, we cheat on our partners, we lie to our partners, we use our partners for wrong things. Or we, or we do things with our partners that are wrong. If we have sexual misconduct, taking rebirth in one of the three lower realms is a given. And the ripened effect will be loneliness. Cannot close our business deal. People we love don't love us back. People create violence toward us. People want to harm us. People want to damage us. So when we have sexual misconduct, negative actions such as harm, damage, violence will come our way. That's one. That's what it says. And, and even after you purified your sexual misconduct, negative karma, the effects similar to the cause will ripen, which is tendency. What is that? Let's say that due to sexual misconduct, you took, re you took rebirth as an animal. After you take rebirth as an animal, when you come out, you're human again, you will still have the tendencies to not be true to the one you have promised. So what happens? You create a lot of pain in their minds. And you know what happens is this is your tendency. You, it, says, it says directly in the text, you will have strong attachment to others' partners. What does that mean? You cannot be true. So that means you may be with one person, 
but you'll be looking at another one, 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 plotting how to get them, plotting how to uh, date them, plotting how to get close to them, plotting how to get intimate with them while you're with that person. Even you don't want to. Even you don't want to do that and you know it's wrong. But you will keep doing that because that's a residual tendency left which is the effect similar to the cause. Why? You didn't hold on to your sexual misconduct vows. So when you don't hold on to your sexual misconduct vows, you have the ripening effect, which is taking rebirth in one of the three lower realms, depending on situation. Secondary, secondary, okay, is that even when you come out with a clean slate, the karma is clean, but the tendency is not. So the tendency is not clean, even you want to go straight, you want to be with one person, one girl, one boy, one relationship. You cannot. You will cheat and lie and cheat and lie, hurt your children, hurt your friends, hurt your neighbors, break the trust of your friends, and have a lot of enemies and people come beat you up. They want to come and knock you over. They want to hurt you. Why? Because you can't control yourself. Why can't you? The tendency is there still. So holding on to the sexual misconduct vows are very important according to Lord Buddha. Why? He's giving you knowledge. He's giving you knowledge. That's why ancient cultures, that is true. Truth is true. You never mind Buddhism. Truth is true. That's why ancient cultures like China and India, all these great cultures, very advanced, they're very strong about moral ethics. That if you have one person, you stick one person, you don't cheat, you don't do all the kind of things. Why? They know that it hurts people. But Buddha goes one step further. The karma is very strong. Third, environmental effect. So I explained to you the ripened effect. Direct. I explained to you the effect similar to the cause. So the effect similar to the cause is having the tendencies not being able to get rid of it. And the tendencies will grow. Then what's the horrible thing is once you indulge in the tendencies, you will replenish that negative karma. So your clean slate becomes dirty again. So it's like you filled up your petrol to hell, your car to hell with petrol again, full tank. Think about it. So guess what? On the way to hell, your petrol keeps refilling itself. Why? Tendency similar to the causes there. Okay, so some people do retreats. They do retreats. After retreat, they still can't control their mouths. They still throw BFs. They still want power. They still they still want to be the top. They still want to. They're still greedy. Why? Maybe their karma for that action was purified, but the tendency is still there. So how to cut the tendency? We must hold our vows. People say it's very hard. I'm telling you why it's hard. Then you say, why tell me why it's hard? I know it's hard. If you understand, easier to attack it. This is from the mind teachings of Lord Buddha, by the way. Okay, I didn't make this up. Even if I did, you think I'm so smart to make up something so sophisticated? No. I'm not that smart to make up something so sophisticated. Oh, you think I am? Thank you. Adrian's like, yes, you are. Thank you. You're beautiful, too. Okay, now, environmental effect. Because he's sending me psychic messages that he wishes that he's as smart and beautiful as I am. So I'm sending a psychic message back. Create the calls. <laughs> Wait a minute, that sounds funny. Ah, I'm just playing. I can tease Adrian, because I know in a few years he's quite funny. Okay. Rebirth. Killing. I'm giving you a few examples. This is not limited. Don't be, oh, that's all I'm nothing on. It's much more. Killing, environmental effect will be, according to Lord Buddha, taking rebirth in environments that are very dangerous, hostile, and uncomfortable. You won't be born in such a beautiful country like Malaysia. We're very safe here. We're very, very safe here. We're very at peace here. I don't care what people complain. We're very at peace here. Natural disasters, okay, except for Nangla. Everything quite okay. Last time they had a tsunami, I had some friends in Penang, I was saying, you better move down here. They didn't listen, so next time I got a tsunami, I said, you should move down here, I told you. No, I'm just kidding. So, safe here. The land is quiet here. It's very easy to practice Dharma. Very easy. Okay, imagine in Japan, every time you go into meditation, a tantric retreat, and a cave, got, it got earthquake, you're like, oh, oh, oh your cave collapsed. <laughs> think, not easy one. <laughs> Just think about it, it's not a joke. Being born in that kind of environment, being stuck there, creates a lot of tension and fear in our minds. That's an environmental effect of karma. All right, killing. Stealing, if you steal, you will be born in barren places. Places that may not be dangerous, but places that fruits, vegetation, crops, plants, what you need to survive is very, very barren. Very dry, not much water, very difficult to get. Not necessarily dangerous, but barren. 
will be the result of speeding. Environmental karma. So karma is broken up to how it manifests to you, huh? It isn't just, oh, I got bad karma, that's it. No. He breaks it down and tells you how it manifests to you. The third is environmental. Then, lying. You'll always be born in places where you get cheated. You get tricked. You get fooled. No matter how hard you work, how sincere you are, how much effort you put, always you cannot move up in any financial way. And some of you think, well, that's not me. No. Some people financially quite okay, but they're very tight. They don't control their finances. The finances control them. It means they're stingy. They're very, very miserly, and they're very secretive, and they hold their money as if it's their three jewels, and they can't let go. That is also an environmental result of stealing or tricking, more tricking other people. So people who cannot let go of wealth is only concerned about wealth and hold on and very miserly and very, very, very stingy. It's a prison. It's a prison for them. It's a prison for others. It's for a prison for them around them. I lived with people when I was growing up. Very close to people who were miserly, and I lived with someone that was very generous. And the miserly one created a lot of suffering for people around us. Calculative, sneaky, don't want to do it, don't want to pay, don't want to give, even if they have to. The generous one, you always feel comfortable around them. It's not you want to use them, you don't feel you'll ever be used. So what happens is, you are born in such a state of mind that not necessarily your poverty is physical, but your poverty is mental. Your poverty is mental. I've met many people. That's my job. That they're very wealthy, but their body is finished. Their mind is finished. They're controlled by other people. They can just look at their wealth. They can't do anything anymore. Environmental result. There are some people that have control of their money. They think, but actually they don't have control of their money. Why? Because they work for money. They work for more money. They are controlled by it, and they're motivated by it. Their principal reason for getting up in the morning is making sure their investments, their money, and their job, and their funds are there, although they're finally their principal investment. Why? Environmental result. So prison can be like that. Then, sexual misconduct. The result of the environmental karma for sexual misconduct karma is always being born in places that are very difficult for you to be healthy, very difficult to be free of disease. And disease doesn't necessarily have to be like from dirty water. It can be transmitted or it can be the potential to get it. Um, always being born in places where you get disease difficult to heal or having hereditary types of diseases even at a very young age. Many, many types of results will come that you have the results of environmental karma from sexual misconduct. Divisive speech. So if you're divisive, if you use your speech to trick others, to use others, to get things from others, to abuse others, you use your speech sweet and nice and diplomatic to cover, to cover your reputation, to look good. Getting something for others doesn't necessarily have to be material. It can be emotional. To look right, to always be all right, and not to have anyone infringe on your reputation. All right? Device of speech. You will be born in, according to Buddha, rugged, very difficult, rugged places, difficult to travel, difficult to communicate, and always burdened by carrying heavy loads. So if we look on the internet, if we look on the news, there are more countries. If you look in those countries of Africa, the majority of them, how do people live? I'm not putting those people down, I dare not. It's a state of existence. There are many people in Asia, even underage kids. Don't look at Malaysia because we're very advanced here. Even in many places in Asia where the kids underage are overwhelmed and overburdened. You can see in papers all the time, carrying heavy loads. That will come as a result of divisive speech. So my point is what is, when we do negative karma, when we do negative karma, it has three effects. One is ripened karma. One is karma that is similar to the cause. Okay, effects similar to the cause. Third one is environmental. So don't just simply say, oh, God, bad karma, bad karma, never mind. No. 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 Don't be so simple. It's not like that. Karma is very, very complex. That's why each one of us look very different. Each one of us are unique. Each one is special. Why? Because karma is very, very complex. It will manifest in us differently. How to counter that? How to counter that? So when we always say, I cannot, I will not, or you go into or you surrender into your negative thoughts, you surrender into your negative emotions, you surrender into your lack of responsibility, you surrender into your 
for me if you surrender into it. You open this karma that is latent. You open this karma that's there. So, ripening karma, effects similar to the cause, and environmental karma is all dormant. Then you say, what's the big deal if it's dormant? It's a very big deal. Oh, if I open up, I experience I, I will purify it. Will, you will purify it. You will purify it. But since your tendency is there, you will continue to do it. So if, if, I, if I say to you, okay, open your karma, you want to purify it by experience, you say, okay, you're very brave. Okay, take your birth as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a lion. Take your birth as a snake. Want to take your birth as a snake? You can purify your karma while you're killing. So once you take your birth as a, a snake, you're making even more karma because you got to kill every day or every week or whatever it is. So what's my point? It's not so simple. One of the best ways to purify this karma, the best way, I'm not going to give you a Tibetan way, I'm not going to give you some Tantra way, I'm going to give you the Buddha way. The Buddhist way, general. The best way to purify karma is not to sit there idle and to fall into these negative emotions. I cannot do it. I can't do it. I'm not ready to do it. I need more time. Why am I being pushed? Never say that. Never. Never. Why? You open the doors for these karma to open up. You open it up. As I made jokes before, you ever hear? You ever hear? Uh, Reverend Chen Yang, Chen Yang Foster, the great Taiwanese nun, say, Oh, I'm not ready to help anybody, anybody anymore. I'm, I give up. I don't think so. You ever hear Mahatma Gandhi say that? Oh, I'm not ready anymore. I, I need more time to save the world. <laughs> I don't think so. Or the Dalai Lama, he makes his Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, I'm taking a five year hiatus to make some money and take care of my kids. And uh, I'll come back to teaching about Buddhas and compassion and purification after five years. Thank you. I don't think so. How come they don't do it and you can? How come you can say, oh, let me choose if I do dharma or I do samsara. Oh, let me choose if I do dharma or not. Let me, let me think. If they don't have an option, you don't have an option. Why? Their karma, your karma is the same. It's the same. So they say, oh, but you're a ripple chief. You're a high lama. You're supposed to do that. Oh, please. High lama, high shmama. They all have karma. I have karma. You have karma, what's the difference? Buddha never wrote, hey, you know, if you're a high lama, of course you're going to be born and you're going to do dharma and you're going to be perfect and everybody else is not perfect. And then you use that as just an excuse. See, I'm not a high lama, I'm not a monk, therefore I don't have to do it. No, that's an excuse. You use that as an excuse not to do it. So don't let your mind trick you. That's the point. I'm not saying you're sneaky. I'm saying tendencies can be sneaky. On the second of the karmic results, Tendencies. See, now when I talk like that, you can like, ah, and just that last time I say karma, say tendency, you look like, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, like that all the time. Like, the more you listen to dharma, the more your mind open. The more your mind will open, the more you listen. So therefore, therefore, if you have received tantric initiation, you should never say, oh, I give up. Oh, I'm not going to do my practice anymore. Oh, I can't help all sentient beings. Oh, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I need a break. I'm going to go away. You shouldn't say that. Do you know why? It's not that you're a bad person. You will open that karma up that maybe you can never come back to it. Why? Your repository of negative karma is very strong for many lifetimes. So you say, but me not saying it doesn't make the feeling go away. Well, it's part of it. If you not saying it doesn't make the feeling go away, why take vows not to create schism? Right? So we don't have to take any speech vows, why? We just take mental vows. Don't think that. You can say it. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't make sense, why? <laughs> so people say like that, I'm just saying it, why? It's nothing. No, you got to think. Speech karma God. That's why you have vows. I mean, I gave you a latte. That's why don't say it. Even you say it, you can affect new people. And one of our vows is not to discourage people from refuge. Refuge is not the ceremony. It's practice and meditation going to the higher teachings. So when we say, when you're a tantra practitioner or you've been with the Lama for a while, you've been there for years, you always say, oh, I can't, I can't change. I, I don't know. I don't know how. Oh, poor me. All the time you do like that, right? You, in fact, push people away from taking refuge. Because they look at you and say, oh, yo, 15 years in Dharma like that. <laughs> And then you look at them like, cannot, cannot, cannot. People who have been in Dharma and taking refuge, never mind Tantra, taking refuge, never say you give up on helping others. Never. Never. Why? When you stop saying that, it's one road closer to stop thinking that. It, it is not one step closer to stop thinking that. Why we take vows on not saying negative things, right? That's one. Second, second, you shouldn't say I can't change. Never say. People who take refuge should never say I can't change. 
Oh, I doubt this. Oh, I don't understand it. Why? There are so many Dharma books out there. If you don't understand, pick one up and read it. Trust me, if it's a Hello magazine about who married who, who had boogly with who, who had two kids, you read the whole cover to cover and memorize and some more doing din din explains people. <laughs> no problem, what? But if it's a Dharma book, it's very heavy. Oh. You don't have the muscle. Turn the page. Very difficult. And you have to fight it. How do you fight it? One day at a time. One day at a time. It's logical. Don't say you give up on others. Don't say you are not ready. Why are you not ready? If you are not ready, it means you become Ted Apam. It means you're already Amitai, but then you have immortal life. Or you're one of the eight immortals of the Chinese mystery, uh, 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 legend. Are you, uh, is there any immortals in here? <laughs> if you're immortal, then you say, I'm not ready. <laughs> okay, so since you and me is not an immortal, don't say you're not ready. Do you know why? Because death isn't going to wait for you. Death isn't going to wait. Therefore, that's one. Second is, you never say, don't push me. Don't make me do it. Then why do you want a guru? You want a guru to go out with you and eat with you and drink with you and do drugs with you and have bubbly with you and run here and buy clothes and have fashion? Is that what you want a guru for? Some of you are thinking, yeah, why not? <laughs> no. No. Yeah, I love Guru. You know, but I wish Wenji do business with me. He looks pretty smart. He can do the pujas, I'll do the deals, we make money, we'll be happy. Well, yeah, right. No. Why do you want a Guru? Of course the Guru will push you. So if you, if the Guru pushes you and you sit there going, don't push me, don't push me, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, don't push me. What do you want a Guru for? Why do you sign the refuge contract? And the refuge contract... Came out, you know? Came out like this one. Came out. So if you have a guru and a guru pushes you, in fact, you should go, wow, he really is a guru. He's not after my money. He's not after me. He's not out to hurt me. He's trying to transform me because he's making me do things that I ordinarily would not or dare do or think I cannot do. But he's showing me that I can do it. He didn't give that to me. He, I gave that to myself, but he showed it to me because he has more experience. So if you have a guru that makes you do things and you wage war on your guru, fight or complain or throw BS or doubt or, or say nasty things behind your guru, you are the loser. Or when you do nasty things, you avoid your guru. You don't see him. When you see him, you look the other way. Or when he goes there, you go over there. Or you, you try to keep quiet. Can I? It's you hiding from yourself. Why do you have a guru? Why? You have a guru because the guru will help you find yourself. So if you avoid the guru, you're avoiding yourself. If the guru challenges you and you say no, why do you have a guru? You're doing well in samsara with all your bad karma yourself. Why do you need a guru to dance along with your bad karma? You think. So if the guru tells you to do it, that's why after we have established a guru-disciple relation, I'm not talking about new people, after we've checked the guru out, we make sure the guru is real and has knowledge and is sincere, and we accept it in our hearts the guru, then we follow. Some people, one year, ten year, five year, three year, up to them. And not necessary, I have to be your guru. Not necessary. No. So my meaning is what is, once you've accepted someone to be your guru, and the guru pushes you, in fact, you should think how kind. In fact, you should think how wonderful. In fact, when they make you do things that you don't...